all Muslims are terrorists. No? Okay, all terrorists are Muslims. Is Islam a violent religion? Was Islam spread by this word? Is Christianity the religion of love and peace? Is Judaism the religion of love and peace? Are Muslims ordered by God to kill innocent people to get 72 virgins in heaven? What happens to someone if he leaves Islam? Do Muslims really have a problem with Jews? Do Muslims force women to cover their hair? Was Muhammad a warlord? Are Muslims trying to kill everyone on earth? Do Muslims really worship a moon god called Allah who wants to kill everyone on earth? Will the world be a safer place without 2 billion Muslims in it? For years, the media kept making these claims about Muslims 24-7 until billions around the world became racist Islamophobes without even knowing what Islam really is. And in the end, this happened. You want me to explode? Yes! That's what I've been waiting for! Um, okay, I'll try. <laughs> Hello, Akbar! Of all the world's religions, Islam is the most violent and aggressive. It encourages killing, or jihad as they call it, in the name of God. The U.S. launched a new wave of air attacks during the invasion of Iraq in 2003. Along the way to the report says there is credible evidence that Australian elite soldiers unlawfully killed 39 people during the Afghan war. We were fishing and having a picnic. Around noon, the foreigners carried out their raid. They arrested my brother and took him to a corner. A few minutes later, they shot him in the head three times, and once in his stomach. Leave! Quick! There were actually offers to turn over bin Laden by the Taliban, and the United States refused. Quick! In the man's hand appears to be a set of red prayer beads. No weapon or radio can be seen. Quick, no! Quick! Leave. Who looks scary out of these two? I mean, he looks a little intimidating, but I don't know scary as well. The guy on the left, he's a model. Yeah. And the guy on the right is Jeffrey Dahmer. I knew it. I knew ah. it. I knew it. He says, you were scared really? of the large what, what, crusaders, what, what, yeah? What large men from the north who came and eat you and your children. Yeah? Are you, are you, are you, you are fucking dinner to us. You are only alive because we have permitted it. Do you understand? One time, my wife and I went to a DSW, and I saw in the distance these two women in black burkas in my store. I cried as I prayed for enough strength to go over there and break both their necks. I had devised a plan, create my own IED, homemade bomb, and I was gonna set it off right outside the Muncie Islamic Center. 200 plus killed or injured, that was the plan. I saw an opportunity to do one last thing for my country. This was my rationale. Who do you find more attractive? This guy right here. On the, the, right. the one on the right? Yeah. Okay. And then finally, who would you trust? The guy on the right. So you trust the guy on the right? Yeah. 17 years ago, these pictures of smiling American guards abusing Iraqi prisoners shook the world, uncovering the dark side of the US's war on terror. The gut-wrenching pictures of sexual abuse, humiliation, and torture of detainees at Abu Ghraib prison sent Washington into damage control. Few things undermined the U.S.'s claim that they were helping bring democracy to Iraq more than the scandal at Abu Ghraib. Today, New Zealanders are still, of course, grieving for the 50 people killed in those brutal attacks on the mosque that were motivated by hate. But they are also resolved that they won't be divided and that the deadly violence unleashed in those mosques will not happen again. But this is very much a country in mourning, struggling to deal with something so many still can't comprehend. I'm Muslim myself, so I feel, I feel like I'm part of the community and I feel, I feel guilty and I feel sad. Get out of my country! You are living under our permission. You savages could be exterminated in a fucking second if you wanted to. And we will want to. You are bringing this on yourself because even though we are opening our doors and our hearts, we're welcoming you in. What do you monsters do? You spread shit. So this is just the Muslim way of life. We don't want that shit. So, what are you gonna so do? don't you worry. 
Don't you worry, we will fucking destroy you and we will eat you for dinner again. You are stealing my house. And if I don't steal it, someone else is going to steal it. No, no one, no one uh, uh, is allowed to steal it, Yammi. Jacob, you know this is not your house. Yes, but if I go, you don't go back. So what's the problem? Why are you yelling at me? I didn't do this. I didn't do this. But you're, it's you're, easy to yell at me, but I didn't do this. You are stealing my house. In April, nearly four months later, the Abu Ghraib scandal broke when CBS News's 60 Minutes broadcast photos showing Iraqi detainees being humiliated and tortured. One showed a US soldier holding a prisoner on a strap made to look like a dog on a leash. Another showed a hooded man standing on a box and holding electrical wires. I do anything for my people, but I don't know what to do. I'm just 10. They don't see happiness. This is not fair for anyone. This is not fair for anyone in Gaza. I want them to see happiness. I want to be, I want to see happiness. We have a kindergarten, a kindergarten who got exploded by a missile from the occupiers. I want to cry. I want to let out of my anger, out of my body, because they're killing people that they don't deserve to die. I did not even sleep last night. I'm really tired. I sleep in the mornings because of the explosions in the night. I can't handle it. I cry in my heart, but I don't show it because I, I don't I don't want my brother to be scared. I say we will eat the Muslims for dinner. Yeah, don't it means you are down in the food chain and we are up in the food chain. Since Israel's creation in 1948, the United States has provided $236 billion in aid and missile defense funding. Human rights groups say the Israeli army has been using US-made military equipment to attack Gaza. In May 2021, Israeli air raids killed 200 people in Gaza during the first week of violence. Dozens were children. It's why people are increasingly asking, why does the US continue to be complicit in Israel's violation of human rights? This exchange happened on the BBC, the so-called guardian of unbiased reportage. Listen to how their panel describes the refugees from Ukraine. It's really emotional for me because I see European people with blue eyes and blonde hair being killed. People with blue eyes and blonde hair. That is why the so-called expert on the BBC is emotional, not because the people are homeless, not because their country is being invaded, but because their hair is blonde. These are not refugees from Syria. These are Christians, they're white, they're, um, they're very similar. To very similar to us. How so? Because the Syrian refugees are Muslims. Their skin is darker, their hair is not blonde. So Europe does not want them. And remember, this is not being said at some white supremacy cult. This is happening on live television. You know, like Iraq or Afghanistan, this is a relatively civilized, uh, relatively European uh, city where you wouldn't expect that or hope that it's going to happen. So Iraq and Afghanistan are uncivilized countries, their people are uncultured, their regimes are irresponsible, so they deserve war, they deserve hundreds of bombs and years of occupation. Ukraine is not a member of the European Union, it is not part of NATO. So what explains this level of assistance? Racism. You see, Ukrainians are Europeans, hence they get the red carpet, but Africans and Asians get border crackdowns and refugee camps. Western media is part of the problem, I have to say. They reflect the public mentality, their sense of European supremacy. And the problem is, governments are not doing anything to help. In fact, they're adding fuel to this fire. Let me show you what Bulgaria's Prime Minister said about refugees, I'm quoting. These people are intelligent, they're educated people. This is not the refugee wave we have been used to. People we are not sure about, we were not sure about their identity. People with unclear pasts who could have been even terrorists. That was a European head of state. He's openly calling West Asian refugees terrorists. If this does not expose Western hypocrisy, nothing does. I say we will eat the Muslims for dinner. Yeah, don't it means you are down in the food chain and we are up in the food chain. Are all these claims about Islam and Muslims really true? Or is it media trying to make you hate a group of people to justify attacking and killing them? In this video, we will settle this debate forever, so make sure you watch until the end first. We will read all verses from the Quran and from the Hadith, which is quotes by the Prophet Muhammad, about how should Muslims deal with Muslims and non-Muslims in war and in peace situations. We will also read all verses from the Bible about the same topics, and we will show you how that affected historical and current events. This video will not be small. We are clarifying and providing evidence to debunk years and years of racist claims. 
it will take time, but it's worth it. You will finally open your eyes and see what's going on for real. Don't judge, don't comment, don't close the video until you get the full picture first, then, and only then, let us know what you think in the comment section below. We will start by reading all verses from the Quran about how to treat non-Muslims in war and peace situations. But before we read, we need to understand something first. Quran is not only describing the relationship between every Muslim and God, no. Quran also describes the relationship between every Muslim and his parents and his family and his neighbors and society. Quran gives legislation for police rules, military rules, politics, and international relationships. Quran is a complete guidance that covers every aspect of human life. Now let's read verse by verse. Chapter 8 verse 60 And prepare for them whatever you are able of power and equipment by which you may terrify the enemy of God and your enemy and others beside them whom you don't know. This verse orders believers to have a powerful army ready to prevent any aggression towards them. Having powerful army will steer away enemies from you, enemies you know and enemies you don't know. This is completely normal in the constitution of any country in the world right now. Every country on earth, small or big, has an army to show that they can defend themselves when needed. What's wrong with that? Chapter 47 verse 4 So when you meet those who disbelieve in battle, strike their necks until when you have inflicted slaughter upon them, then take captives, and then either let captives go without ransom as a favor or ask for ransom until the war is over. Islamophobes read this verse but purposely ignore the last sentence, until the war is over. They don't read this part to make it look like God is ordering Muslims to kill disbelievers in general. While it clearly says that you should be courageous in war, don't run away, and fight with power and courage until the war is over. It has nothing to do with peaceful people. It's only describing war situation. What's wrong with that? Chapter 8 verse 61 And if they incline to peace, then you incline to it too. God is giving a rule to Muslims to accept peace if their enemy offers peace. Still think that this is a violent religion? Chapter 5 verse 32 Killing one innocent soul is like killing all mankind. Saving one soul is like saving all mankind. Do you think Quran is ordering to kill innocent people while it clearly states that killing one innocent soul is like killing all mankind? Do you think this is a violent religion? Chapter 5 verse 33 Indeed, the legal retribution for those who commit acts of violence and terrorism against individuals for treason and aggression against the state and wage war against God and his messenger and strive upon earth to cause corruption is none but they should be killed or crucified or their hands and feet should be cut off from opposite sides or they should be exiled from the land. That's for them a disgrace in this world and for them in the hereafter is a great punishment. Again, this verse is asking believers to be very, very harsh towards people who commit violence and terrorism. It's ordering Muslims to stop terrorists and violent people. It has nothing to do with peaceful people. Still think that this is a violent religion? And if you read the next verse, it says, Except for those who stop and repent before you overcome them, and know that God is forgiving and merciful. So God is also teaching Muslims to forgive these violent people if they decide to stop their aggression. Still think this is a violent religion? Chapter 4 verse 75 And what's the matter with you, that you fight not in the cause of God and for the oppressed among men, women and children who say, Our Lord, take us out of this city of oppressive people and appoint for us from yourself a protector and appoint for us from yourself a helper. Here God is teaching Muslims to help oppressed people. Don't be selfish and say it's their problem, it's not our problem. If people are oppressed and asking for help, Muslims should help them. This is fighting against oppressors and helping the innocent. Still think that this is a violent religion? Chapter 60 verse 8 God does not forbid you from those who do not fight you because of your religion and do not expel you from your homes from being righteous towards them and act justly towards them. Indeed, God loves those who act justly. Here God is teaching Muslims to act righteously and justly towards non-believers who do not attack your country. Still think that this is a violent religion? Chapter 60 verse 9 God only forbids you from those who fight you because of your religion and expel you from your homes and aid in your expulsion. Forbids that you make allies with them. 
and whoever makes a lies with them, then it's those who are the wrongdoers. So if someone attacks you and takes your homes, you shouldn't be their allies. Can you see anything wrong with that? So if someone is attacking you, God is forbidding you to be their allies. Like in chapter 5, for example, where Quran was talking about Jews and Christians who made fun of Muhammad and took his message ridicule and amusement. God is asking Muslims not to be their allies. So it says, chapter 5, verse 51, O you who believe, do not take the Jews and the Christians as allies. They are in fact allies of one another. And whoever is allies to them among you, then indeed he is one of them. And then verse 57, O you who believe, take not those who have taken your religion in ridicule and amusement among the ones who are given the scripture before you, nor the disbelievers as allies. And fear God if you should truly be believers. And when you call to prayers, they take it ridicule and amusement. This is because they are people who do not use reason. Say, O people of the scripture, people of the scripture in Quran is Christians and Jews. Do you resent us for the fact that we have believed in God and what was revealed to us and what was revealed before and because most of you are definitely disobedient to God? You can think of these verses in the current political system as something like NATO. NATO members offer peace for the whole world, but they are only military allies with each other. So Muslims by default are allies like NATO and will not be allies with whoever don't respect their religion. What's wrong with that? Chapter 4 verse 94 O you who believed, when you go forth to fight in the cause of Allah, investigate, and do not say to one who gives you a greeting of peace, you're not a believer. This verse destroys the whole violence scream. Here God is teaching Muslims not to fight someone who offers peace, even if they think he is not a believer. So Muslims can't fight someone for the reason of being a disbeliever. This is not a reason. It's forbidden in Islam to fight a disbeliever for no reason. Still think this is a violent religion? Chapter 4 verse 91 So if they do not withdraw from you and offer you peace or restrain their hands, then seize them and kill them wherever you overtake them. Also this verse is used by Islamophobes a lot. They purposely read the second half of it to make it look like God is ordering Muslims to kill everyone. But if you read it, you can see that it starts with a condition. If they do not stop attacking you, if they do not offer peace, kill them. What's wrong with that? It has nothing to do with peaceful people. Chapter 9 verse 6 And if any of the polytheists seek your protection, then grant him protection, so that he may hear the words of God, Quran, then deliver him to his place of safety. Again, this is how God in the Quran is ordering Muslims to treat disbelievers who are peaceful. Still think this is a violent religion? Chapter 2 verse 190 Fight in the way of God those who fight against you, but do not transgress. Indeed, God does not like transgressors. This verse is very, 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 very clear. God ordered Muslims to only fight back against whoever attacks them, and clearly told Muslims never to be the attackers, to always be on the defender's side. Still think this is a violent religion? Chapter 2 verse 193 Fight them until there is no more fitna and until religion is acknowledged to be for God. But if they stop their aggression, then there is to be no aggression or assault except against the oppressors. This verse is usually used by Islamophobes. They only read the first part to make it seem like God is ordering Muslims to start a war. But if you read it fully, it says, fight them until they stop their aggression. That clearly means defend yourself against those who are committing aggression towards you. And if they stop, you also stop. What's wrong with that? Still think this is a violent religion? Chapter 49 verse 9 And if two factions among the believers should fight, then make settlement between the two. But if one of them oppresses the other, then fight against the one that oppresses until it returns to the ordinance of God. And if it returns, then make settlement between them in justice and act justly. Indeed, God loves those who act justly. This verse shows that war is only against the oppressors even if they are Muslims. So it doesn't matter if they are Muslims or not. The point is God doesn't like oppressors. It has nothing to do with the religion. And finally, chapter 49 verse 13. O mankind, indeed we created you from male and female and made you nations and tribes that you may know one another. Indeed, the most noble of you in the sight of God is the most righteous. Indeed, God is all-knowing and all-aware. This verse clearly says that we should know each other, not fight with each other. Still think this is a violent religion?
what about verses that say to force people to become Muslims or force women to cover their hair or kill whoever who leaves Islam? Let's read them together. Chapter 10, verse 99. And had your Lord willed, those on earth would have believed, all of them, entirely. Then Muhammad, why would you force the people to become believers? God is clearly disapproving any kind of force when it comes to advising people to believe. Chapter 18, verse 29. And say, the truth is from your Lord, so whoever wills, let him believe, and whoever wills, let him disbelieve. This verse is self-explanatory. If you don't want to believe, don't believe. It's very clear. Chapter 50, verse 45. We are most knowing of what they say, and you are not to force people to believe or submit, but remind by the Quran whoever feels hellfire. Again, this one is also self-explanatory. Don't force people to believe. You just give reminder to whoever fears hellfire. That's it. Deliver the message. Don't force anyone. Chapter 109. Say, Disbelievers, I do not worship what you worship, nor you are worshippers of what I worship, nor I will be a worshipper of what you worship, nor you will be worshippers of what I worship. For you is your religion, and for me is my religion. This is another chapter describing the relationship between Muslims and non-Muslims. Can you see any force or aggression here? For you is your religion, for me is my religion. Where is the violence? Chapter 2 verse 256 There shall be no compulsion or force in the acceptance of religion. This is pretty direct. The right course has become distinct from the wrong. This final verse is as clear as the sun. Doesn't need any further explanation. No compulsion or force in the acceptance of religion. And regarding whoever leaves Islam, God is giving a huge threat in the Quran. Read this one with me. Chapter 5, verse 54. O you who believed, whoever of you should revert from his religion, God will bring forth instead of him people, and he will love them, and they will love him. God didn't say kill them or force them. God said he will guide other people who will love him, and he will love them. Where is the killing part? Then what is the apostasy rule in Islam? In other words, what happens if you leave Islam? The short answer is nothing, absolutely nothing. And the long answer is it's permissible to kill someone who left Islam and did treason to his country. Someone who left Islam and joined enemy forces, whether physically or by providing secret information to enemies to help them. This is what we call now a spy or an agent to an enemy army in war situation. This particular person should be executed. Unfortunately, some people misunderstood two hadith or quotes from the Prophet Muhammad. The first one, it says, it's forbidden to execute any Muslim except for three reasons. One of them is, whoever left Islam and went against the group. And because this one is not very clear, Prophet Muhammad clarified himself in another hadith. Said the same thing again. He said, it's forbidden to execute any Muslim except for three reasons. One of them is whoever left Islam and started a war against our nation. Hope it's clear now that it's a normal rule that almost every country on earth, including your own country, has it. Hope it's clear now that Quran clearly forbids any kind of force in religion in any way. Hope it's clear now that Quran clearly forbids any kind of terror or aggression towards peaceful nations. These are 22 verses talking about war and peace in 600 plus pages in the Holy Quran. All of these 22 verses can be put in one page. Maybe someday you should also read the other 599 pages talking about how to be a decent human being. And I'm sure you haven't read the apostasy rules in the Bible because the Bible is very clear on how to treat disbelievers. And it doesn't specify if it's war situation or not. I'm talking about a peaceful disbeliever. Check this out. Deuteronomy 13, 6 to 10. If your very own brother, or your son, or your daughter, or the wife you love, or your closest friend secretly entices you, saying, Let us go and worship other gods, do not yield them or listen to them. Show them no pity, do not spare them or shield them, you must certainly put them to death. Your hand must be the first in putting them to death, and then the hands of all the people. Stone them to death because they tried to turn you away from the Lord your God. It is clear here that this person did not rage war against you, is not a violent person. He is peacefully trying to convince you to worship other gods. So he is a genuine disbeliever who is peaceful. What should you do to him? You should kill him with your own hands first and then with the hands of other believers. 
This is the apostasy rule in the Bible. Can you see any difference? And also in the New Testament, Luke 19, 27. But those enemies of mine who did not want me to be king over them, bring them here and kill them in front of me. Another one. Deuteronomy 13, 13 to 16. The troublemakers have risen among you and have led the people of their town astray, saying, let us go and worship other gods. Then you must inquire, probe, and investigate it truly. And if it's true, and it has been proved that this detestable thing has been done among you, you must certainly put to the sword all who have lived in that town. You must destroy it completely, both its people and its livestock. You are to gather all the plunder of the town into the middle of the public square and completely burn the town and all its plunder as a whole burnt offering to the Lord your God. The town is to remain a ruin forever, never to be rebuilt. Now I will give you a task. Research how Christianity spread all over the world. Also research specifically how Christianity spread in South America. And let me know what you find out in the comment section below. But what about war and peace in Hadith, which are quotes by the Prophet Muhammad? Let's read them. The Messenger of God said, Do not wish to encounter with the enemy. Pray to Allah to grant you safety, but when you encounter them, show patience. Is that a blood-hungry warlord in your opinion? He's saying we shouldn't wish to encounter any enemies. Next one. In the condition of war, Prophet Muhammad put the following rules. The Prophet said, Go in God's name, trusting in God and adhering to his religion. Do not kill a decrepit old man, or a young infant, or a child, or a woman. Do not be dishonest about spoils. Do right and act well, for God loves those who do well. This is the exact opposite of what we read in the Bible. 1 Samuel 15.3 Put to death men and women, children and infants, cattle and sheep, camels and donkeys. Muhammad is saying don't kill women and children and old people, don't even cut a tree, while in the Bible it says, put to death men and women, children and infants. Infants. Amazing how media can completely reverse the truth upside down. Next hadith says, whoever secures the man's blood and then kills him, then I am innocent of this murder, even if the murdered was an infidel. So this hadith clearly says that you cannot kill anyone outside of war situation, even if he is a disbeliever. Still think this is a violent religion? Next one says, whoever kills a mu'ahad, a mu'ahad is a person who is living under peace agreement, shall not smell the fragrance of paradise. Paradise in Islam is the eternal happiness in heaven. So if you kill a non-believer who is peaceful, you will never enter paradise. Still think this is a violent religion? Next one, the messenger of Allah said, beware if anyone wrongs a mu'ahad or diminishes his rights or forces him to work beyond his capacity or takes from him anything without his consent. I shall plead for this man in the day of judgment. So every peaceful non-Muslim in an Islamic state has all citizenship rights, according to Prophet Muhammad. Still think this is a violent religion? Next one, the messenger of God said, peace is one of the names of God. He put it on earth, so spread peace. You will never hear this quote from Prophet Muhammad in the media, ever. I think you already know why. The opening of Mecca is the best example because there is a huge difference between forgiveness and mercy in the position of power and in the position of weakness. Quick recap, pagans of Mecca were the most violent people towards early Muslims. They tortured them, prevented them food and water for years, killed a lot of them, started several wars against them aiming to kill everyone for more than 20 years. In the end, a lot of people accepted Islam and Muslims were larger in numbers and power. So the pagans of Mecca had to surrender to Muhammad. What do you think he did to them after 20 years of constant violence, aggression and murder? He told them, Idhabu fa'antum at Go, you're free. I forgive you. He told them, you can stay in your homes. You don't have to become Muslims. You can live peacefully. The only difference is, you shall not be violent criminals anymore. That's it. Still think Muhammad was a bloodthirsty warlord? And this was part of his speech in his last pilgrimage. O oh people, your God is one. An Arab is not better than a non-Arab. A non-Arab is not better than an Arab. A white person is not better than a black person. A black person is not better than a white person. The one who is better in the eyes of God is the most decent and righteous. When did the West start fighting racism? And finally, this is the constitution that the Caliphate Omar ibn al-Khattab gave to the inhabitants of Palestine in 636 AD. 
This is what gave the servant of God, Omar, commander of the believers, security to the people of Elia. He gave them security for themselves, their money, their churches, their crosses, and the rest of their faith. Their churches shall not be inhabited, destroyed, or diminished, nor from their space, nor from their cross, nor from any of their money, and they shall not be forced to change their religion, and none of them shall be harmed. This is in 636 AD. When did the West learn about human rights? We're sorry, but we didn't find anything about 72 versions for whoever kills innocent people. We didn't find any act of transgression whatsoever. We only found peace and tolerance and order to prepare and fight back against who fights you, which is the constitution of every country on earth. Live peacefully, but prepare an army to defend yourself. The only difference in Islam, God said that if the army offers peace, then Muslims have to accept peace. And even in the war itself, Muslims can't kill women, children, old men, civilians, animals, or even cut a tree. The only difference is there is no Hiroshima and Nagasaki in Islam. The only difference is God ordered Muslims to only conduct defensive wars, and even in these wars, do not hurt civilians. And of course, we are here talking about Quran and the teachings of Prophet Muhammad, not about current Muslim countries. Whether they accept and follow Quran or not is another subject. Taking one innocent life is extremism because you're like, it is like taking the life of all of humanity. Extremism means you cannot kill non-combatants even in a just war. After one of the battles, a defensive battle of Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, he saw a woman dead. He called his uh, soldiers and he said, even in a war, do not kill women and children. So we are supposed to be extra careful not to harm, touch or kill the civilians of the enemy population. On top of it, right, there is no, there is no carpet bombing in Islam. There is no Hiroshima, Nagasaki in Islam. Even if the enemy kills your civilian population, even then Islam does not give me the right to harm their civilian population. So lastly about the jihadis, if the enemy incline towards peace, Muslim soldiers should drop their weapons and incline towards peace, right? And then the last S would be to save lives, to remove the oppression so human lives can be saved. That Islam was spread by the sword. The reply to this allegation is given very well by a famous historian by the name of Delisi O'Leary. He mentions in the book Islam at the Crossroad on page number 8, Delisi O'Leary says, history makes it clear that the legend of fanatical Muslims sweeping across the world, forcing Islam at the point of the sword over conquered races is the most fantastic, absurd myth that historians have ever repeated. I would like to repeat the statement of Delisi O'Leary the famous historian, history makes it clear that the legend of fanatical Muslims forcing Islam at the point of the sword over conquered races is the most absurd, fantastic myth that historians have ever repeated. When we read history, we come to know that we Muslims, the Arabs, they ruled the Arab lands for the past 1400 years. For a few years, the Britishers came, for a few years, the French came, but as a whole, the Muslim Arabs were the lords of the Arab lands. Yet today, there are more than 9 million Arabs who are Coptic Christians. Coptic Christian means they are Christians in generation. These 9 million Arab Christians are giving shahada, are bearing witness that Islam was inspired by the sword. We Muslims, we ruled India for about a thousand years. That time India was the most powerful country in the world. The Mughals, the Muslims. If we wanted, we could have forced every non-Muslim to accept Islam at the point of the sword. We didn't do it. Today, in India, more than 80% of the Indians, they are non-Muslims. These 80% non-Muslim Indians, they are giving shahada, they are bearing witness that Islam was inspired by the sword. Today, the largest populated Muslim country in the world is Indonesia. I am asking the question, which Muslim army went to Indonesia? Which Muslim army came to Malaysia, which has more than 55% Muslims? Which Muslim army? Which Muslim army went to the east coast of Africa? Which sword? Thomas Carlyle writes in his book, 
heroes and hero worship. He places our Nabi Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as his number one hero prophet. Number one. And he writes that every new idea originates in the mind of one. In one man's mind, it dwells. One man in the full world. It will do little good if he takes up a sword and propagates it. You have to first get your sword, the sword of intellect. As Allah says in the Quran in Surah Nahal, chapter 16, verse 125. Invite all to the way of thy Lord with wisdom and beautiful preaching and argue with them and reason with them in the ways that are best and most gracious. Now it's time to look at war and peace verses from the Bible. Let's start by the verses most Christian apologists use first. Matthew 5, 39. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. Matthew 5, 44. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Wow, that is so peaceful. Peaceful to an extent that no Christian will ever do that. Ever. If that's true, then why do we have police? We can just be nice to thieves and rapists. Why do we have military? We can just be nice to invaders. In my opinion, I call these verses the verses of hypocrisy. Now let's read the dark side of the Bible, the side that no Christian apologist will ever mention. Matthew 10:34. Jesus says, Do not suppose that I've come to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. A sword? I thought the moon god of Islam came with the sword, not Jesus. Matthew 10:35. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Doesn't sound so peaceful to me. Numbers 31:14 to 18. Moses was angry with the officers of his army. Have you allowed all the women to live? He asked them. Now kill all the boys, kill every woman who slept with a man, but say for yourselves every girl who have never slept with a man. According to Jews, this is God ordering Moses to kill women and children and to rape the virgins. And according to Christians, this is Jesus, the God of Moses, ordering Moses to kill the women and children and to rape the virgins. Also in 1 Samuel 15.3, listen now to the message from the Lord. Again, who is the Lord? Jesus is the Lord, right? Now go, attack the Amalekites and totally destroy all that belongs to them. Do not spare them, put to death men and women, children and infants, cattle and sheep, camels and donkeys. Again, the God of the Bible, or Jesus, is ordering the death of children and infants. While Muhammad clearly said that even if you are in a defensive war, do not kill older men or women or children or even cut a tree. Huge difference. Revelation 17:14. They will wage war against the lamp, but the lamp will triumph over them because he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. This verse is describing Jesus coming back as a warlord, waging war against everyone who doesn't believe in him. Where is the freedom of religion? At least in Islam, the Quran says there is no compulsion in religion. But here, it's the opposite. 2 Kings 10.17 When Jehu came to Samaria, he killed all who were left there of Ahab's family. He destroyed them, according to the word of the Lord spoken to Elijah. Here again, the Bible God ordered to kill all of Ahab's family. Joshua 13.16 Rip open their pregnant bellies and dash the babies on the ground, and you will be accepted in the kingdom of heaven. Again, I do not know why the Bible God loves killing babies. Book of Ezekiel 9.5-6 As I listened, he said to the others, follow him through the city and kill without showing pity or compassion. Slaughter old men, young men, and maidens, and women, and children. For the fourth time, the Bible God is ordering the killing of women and children. In Deuteronomy 20, 10 to 14, Bible God is ordering to attack the city. If they surrender, take them as slaves. If they don't, kill the men and take the women and children for yourselves. In Jeremiah 48, 10, God curses whoever does not use his sword to shed blood. 
In Ezekiel 9, 6, God is again ordering the slaughtering of old men, women, and children. In Joshua 6, 21, God is ordering the killing of everyone, men and women, young and old, also animals. In Jeremiah 11, 22, God will kill men by the sword and children by famine, slow death. In Jeremiah 46, 10, God's sword is thirsty for blood. In Hosea 13, 6, Bible God loves killing babies inside pregnant women's wombs, and of course, killing little ones. In Jeremiah 14, 12, Bible God will destroy them by the sword. In Exodus 22, 20, Bible God orders the killing of anyone who sacrifices to any other God. Where is the freedom of religion? In 2 John 10, God is forbidding you to welcome this believer in your house. In Deuteronomy 20, 16, the Bible God is ordering to kill anything that is alive, doesn't matter warrior or civilian. In Isaiah 13, 15 to 16, Bible God is still ordering the killing of infants. I don't know why the Bible God loves killing the infants that much. In Exodus 22, 24, you will find more killing by the sword. In Ezekiel 11, 8, also more killing by the sword. It's amazing how the media can brainwash a whole population into thinking the innocents are guilty and the guilty are innocent. You can clearly now see with your own eyes the difference between both scriptures. My friend, if you are too lazy to read the original books and you're happy with listening to liars, that's on you. Books are available. You can easily find the truth. You have to put a little bit of effort before accusing two billion people of something that is only available in your book. Accusing them of doing bad stuff that Quran condemns and could only be found in the Bible. And the peace offering from us? If you decide to spare time to read the Quran, we can assign an Arabic-speaking person to read it with you over several online calls for free. Just contact us on Facebook or Discord and we will arrange everything. Get away from these Muslims! Islam spread by the sword! 604 pages, 114 chapters, 6,666 verses. Depending on how you count them up, guess what? And many words in Arabic for swords. Say, Muhammad, Hussam, the, I think 16 words for sword. Guess how many times I found the, any of those words in the Arabic? Zero. Not once. In the Bible, just the word sword over 200 times so when I take my Bible to the preacher and I said excuse me it says here that Jesus said I did not come with peace I came with a sword and it's time to sell your coat and buy a sword what did that mean you know what he said listen to this You'll never believe how people can lie. He said, don't you know this was done in Italy where they transcribed this stuff, the Latin, you know, it was in Italy. Rome is in Italy. Don't you know that? I said, yeah. He said, and they would work by candlelight at night and it was hard to see. Yeah. And while they were trying to translate, you know, put this down in the Latin language, you know what happened? They were eating spaghetti. The Italians, they like spaghetti. And spaghetti fell down and it made an S. It was word. It wasn't sword. It was word. He said, I came with a word. Then you know what's wrong with that? The word for word in Kone Greek is logos. Now, how did they turn logos into sword? By dropping spaghetti on it. And here, excuse me, but what does it mean, sell your coat and buy a word? What is it, a game show on TV? I'd like to buy that word right there for $100, please. What is this? And the more I talked to them, the more I could see lie after lie after lie. And finally, I said, you know what? I don't need to be in a religion full of liars. In the next video, we're going to discuss how these two books, Quran and the Bible, affected history. We're going to discuss the question, did Islam spread by the sword or not? We're going to talk about the relationship between Muslims and Jews and see if there is actually a problem between them or not. We're going to talk about 
the misbehavior of some Middle Eastern governments and the misbehavior of the Iranian government and how is that related to Islam? We're gonna talk about the Sharia law and if it's really violent and barbaric or not. You will find the link to this video in the description and if you think you learned something today, you should subscribe because we have more. See you in the next video. Assalamu alaikum.